uh, as over the past some nearly 30 years in diplomacy, I have engaged in ASEAN, because this is something that, I, that is uh, personally my own thoughts, my own uh, viewpoints and perspectives and paradigms. They are probably uh, wrong, uh, but it is what it is. It is how I have uh, worked and it is how I have, I have uh, tried to develop Indonesia's policies on ASEAN. So what I'm about to share are essentially my own thoughts and my own personal uh, views on how ASEAN and Indonesia has uh, interacted uh, over the recent years. I like the word dynamics uh, that you have uh, so kindly uh, included uh, in the uh, theme for our uh, discussion because I am uh, personally of the view uh, that change uh, is permanent. Uh, and I think this is a, a quality or a, a situation that all of us must uh, recognize and not necessarily uh, fight or resist. Uh, that uncertainties in our region are a given. Uh, they are uh, inevitable. But having said that change is permanent and there's constant dynamics, constant uh, sense of uncertainty, uh, what is not, in my view, a given is a sense of drift. Because I think there is a distinct difference uh, in quality between uncertainties, not knowing what is uh, before us in terms of regional and global developments, and uh, a sense of drift. A sense of drift, in my view, is essentially a policy outcome when governments and countries and states either have uh, policy contradictions, policy vacuums, or policy incoherence in reacting or in responding to changing dynamics. And as a result, we have a sense of a region uh, in a state of drift. Uh, this is where I think we need to be applying ourselves to ensure that given a state of permanent change, given the uncertainties, that we are not actually making things worse by lacking in our reaction, lacking in our response, and even worse still, absent in our uh, more proactive shaping and molding. I'd like to refer to some past examples where Indonesia, where, where I have personally uh, sought to change the dynamics within ASEAN. Uh, based on the premise that I had said before, since change are inevitable, uh, then our mindset should be, instead of resisting, instead of simply reacting, we should be shaping and molding uh, this change so there are changes for the better. And in Indonesia's case, in, and in my own personal experience, this is a full-time, 24-7 effort to ensure that the dynamics are positive dynamics, the changes taking place in ASEAN are positive changes. At many uh, junctures in ASEAN's past, Indonesia has been out there shaping and molding. And I'd like to give some, uh, at the risk of caricature, some uh, key junctures or key themes that where Indonesia have sought not only to respond, but, see, but actually to shape ASEAN's changing dynamics. One level is actually in intra-ASEAN relations. Uh, the very uh, reason, in our view, in my view, of why ASEAN is, was sorely needed back in 1969. To transform the intra-Southeast Asian relationship that had once been marked by trust deficit to become one of strategic trust. Transformation of such a nature cannot be promulgated by declaration cannot be promulgated by issuance of statements, chairman statements or Jane communique. Uh, 
but it must be constantly nurtured, aggressively waged, and constantly invested. And of course here, our founding fathers and uh, early leaders of ASEAN uh, showed us the way. Apart from the Bangkok Declaration itself, the 1976 Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, barely a decade after ASEAN's uh, promulgation and founding, was a very far-sighted document that I think reflects the leadership then our leaders demonstrate, uh, not only to take the region as it was, rather to actually shape and mold and promote new dynamics. In my own experience of ASEAN since then, the essential task is how one can continue to build on the TAC of 1976, how we can continue to develop the strategic trust that was uh, at still developing at the time. And of course, in this connection, the ASEAN political security community pillar that Indonesia introduced in 2002 during its chairmanship of ASEAN became its principal uh, vehicle. In 2002, of course, uh, Singapore had introduced the idea of an ASEAN economic community. Uh, Indonesia uh, add to such a vision the idea of a political security community, uh, essentially to encourage ASEAN to develop conflict resolution capacities uh, among its member states. Now, all of you in this room are extremely knowledgeable on matters to do with the APAC, so I won't go into details of what it actually entails. But uh, no doubt many of you would be alerted to the fact that many of such provisions, not least the 1976 TAC, have remained essentially dormant. Uh, you know, the TAC, the council that have been so carefully crafted by our leaders then, have never been formally invoked. And, and many of the features of the APAC uh, are there as a plan to be acted on, as a, as, a, as a mechanism modalities to be employed and deployed, but on the whole, they have not been uh, formally resorted to in many an instance. But by way of um, illustration, Indonesia never feared of uh, proposing ideas for the APSC, which may not necessarily be immediately supported. S some of you who were then working with the ASEAN Secretariat, I'm sure may recall when we discussed the APSC, myself as a then Director General for ASEAN Cooperation under the guidance of Minister Hassan Wirayuda, we proposed the idea of having among ASEAN member states a list of all the territorial disputes that Southeast Asia was then confronting. Uh, like a so as part of our, our wish to develop uh, over the horizon early detection capacity. A list where all of us as ASEAN 10 can deposit, these are the border issues, the uh, bilateral issues that we, are, we have with our neighbors. But that idea never took off. It was too controversial, I guess, uh, for want of a better term within ASEAN, uh, to have uh, a list of problems that's almost tantamount to acknowledging uh, you know, sensitive issues about uh, your, your claims to certain uh, border issues and the like. So that never uh, found traction, but we tried. Likewise, we, we suggested the idea of having a peacekeeping force for ASEAN uh, both for in the region deployment or out of the region deployment, uh, never actually found full support, but the capacity on peacekeeping did. So we have now uh, the idea of a more coordinated ASEAN peacekeeping capacities uh, uh, effort. The point that I wish to make 
And of course, we have the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation that actually found extraction, not as, not as, uh, as uh, profound as we had wished, because among others, we had wished for the IPER to have uh, a roster of mediators that can be deployed at short notice uh, whenever a uh, conflict situation arises among ASEAN countries, but I think that idea also didn't find immediate traction. But the point I wanted to emphasize is that Indonesia, and I work myself working within it, we were always <coughs> constantly prodding and pushing for the outer bounds of ASEAN uh, cooperation. I did mention that many of these potential remain on the whole uh, dormant, in the sense that they have not been formally uh, invoked. And herein lies the importance of state practice. I think in Southeast Asia, in ASEAN, uh, we, uh, we have a situation now, the easier part of developing the institutions, the capacities, the agreements are actually quite advanced and quite mature. But we still have the political problem of trust deficit, not only between states, but trust in terms of empowering and utilizing the ASEAN modalities. Instead, we keep on hearing the need to revise the charter, revise, and I can, as I said before, a couple of days ago, officials can go on and on to revise all these documents when I, I, I believe the fault doesn't lie in the actual documents. It's just, are we as member states uh, willing to deploy and employ them. The trust deficit between member states and the very institutions and modalities that they have created. Uh, we have tried, I have tried to inject uh, fresh dynamics, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, 2011. And as I had said before, unprecedented for ASEAN as a body and not ASEAN individual ASEAN member state. ASEAN as a collective entity to actually address this issue. Um, by way of context, in 2008, uh, the same issue was brought to the Security Council of the United Nations. And at the time, a very unique situation where Vietnam and Indonesia were both sitting in the Security Council. And actually, Vietnam's permanent representative was Ambassador Min, who eventually became our Secretary General, and I was sitting as our permanent representative at the United Nations. And when the matter was brought before the UN in 2008, July, it wasn't a, a good spot to be as an ASEAN member because there was no ASEAN script. Uh, Cambodia wished the issue to be discussed at the UN Security Council. Thailand didn't want it at all. And here we are, two ASEAN member states at the UN. The rest of the UN member states were looking at us but we can all the best we can say is that uh, uh, you know we have our national position. They were the United Nations Security Council were desperate and looking for a regional solution. I know that Singapore in July of 2008 tried valiantly uh, in a retreat meeting here in Singapore uh, to have an ASEAN approach on the issue, including the idea of having a contact group on the issue of. Thailand, Cambodia border issue, but that never found traction. Fortunately, I had a, not fortunately, but the, the reality is I had another crack at the problem in January, February 2011. This time under Indonesia's chairmanship of ASEAN, and uh, when the border issue erupted on the 5th or 7th of uh, February, uh, this time I said to myself, uh, in terms of dynamics, uh, we are going to handle this differently. I am not going to be overly perfect in seeking for a rather laborious process of step-by-step uh, -step seeking uh, endorsement for before I, because I see the charter having given sufficient room to the chairman of ASEAN uh, to act urgently and quickly to manage uh, the problem. So it wasn't the charter that is at fault. I think it's basically, are we as member states able and willing to, in, to, to proceed? And in proceeding, uh, we, I was fortunate in having two foreign ministers, Hong Nang Hong and foreign minister uh, Kasit Piromia of Thailand, uh, 
who had an open mind and who had trust in Indonesia's efforts. And uh, together with ASEAN, we were able to manage the issue. At the United Nations, uh, when the United Nations met, I went to the two countries uh, two days after the violence erupted, and then there was a Security Council meeting on the 14th of February. We were there, uh, the three of us, but we had a script. It wasn't a loose cannon issue. Uh, it, we weren't there as a, as a problem. Of course, it, as there's a problem, but at least we have a, a potential script. And we deliberately, purposely, even before we head to the United Nations, we already say we are going to have an ASEAN informal retreat on the 22nd of February. So always like passing the baton, always having a next step forward so the UN can rely and can, can, can look at oh, ASEAN has a script. There is no dead end road. There is no a vacuum of ASEAN uh, script. And that we did slowly, uh, visits to the two regions, the two countries, uh, Security Council meeting in 14th of February, 22nd of February, ASEAN Foreign Ministers retreat, more meetings between the three of us, and then the ASEAN summit, and then the ICJ, the International Court of Justice in July of 2011, endorsed ASEAN's role. In six months, uh, four months, a quick, rapid ASEAN response managed to manage the conflict potentials in the way we did. And I was hoping, and I'm still continuing to hope, setting a state practice that we can, with the requisite political will and, and willingness to even fail, uh, change the dynamics. Uh, for us, for me, at the, at the time, not doing anything the risk is far greater than the risk of failure. I would rather that we learn from our failure than wondering what could have been if we do not take any action. So that's the first by, uh, dynamics that we have been trying to alter, to influence as by way of Indonesia, my own thoughts, namely the intra-Southeast Asian conflict resolution dynamics to be sure that we are actually a net contributor to international peace and security, but in cases where we have a problem, we have a solution as well. Uh, I am one of those uh, who believe that for every solution inbuilt within it, uh, every problem inbuilt within it, there's always a solution ready. It's just how urgently we are going to look for that solution. The second dynamics that we had tried to um, influence or inject positive influence on is arguably the more sensitive and arguably the most uh, complex one. It's the one that we've been discussing over the past a, a couple of days ago. Namely, the nexus or the link between national, uh, regional, and global. Um, in particular, how developments within ASEAN member states how are we going to uh, treat these developments? Are, they, are we to adopt a very restrictive, uh, don't express your concern, don't express your attention mindset, or are we going to have a more nuanced approach? And here, my thoughts, again, as I, I pr promised before at the beginning, I'm simply sharing my own thoughts for, with all its failings. Uh, I drew lessons learned from our, our experience on East Timor whose ambassador I wish to acknowledge, Ambassador Timor of Timor-Leste. We draw lessons learned in terms of ASEAN in the sense that uh, we need to earn the understanding of our region, meaning uh, you cannot expect our region to understand or even hopefully support our an, a position if we take our region for granted, uh, that we never actually reach out to explain uh, what was going on, what our problems are, what our shortcomings are, to seek their advice. Because in the end, although ASEAN was always collectively, uh, you know, formally supportive of Indonesia's position, uh, when the developments occur in Timor-Leste, uh, there was not really an ASEAN script. Not an ASEAN script. And, you know, I mean, there were, we jumped immediately from national to global. 
There was never one step uh, beforehand. And therefore, we were determined that for the future, we need to have a better connectivity between national and the regional. We speak, myself and Minister Hassan Wirayuda then speak of intermestic, international and domestic are actually one. This is not in denial of state sovereignty, but we are not being insensitive about our national rights. No, we are actually, it expressed in my view, confidence in our national situation if we are ready to share our developments. Not only Timor-Leste, but in general, we recognized then that Indonesia was changing as a country, transformative period of reform and democratization. We wanted to be sure that the changes that's taking place in Indonesia was not in isolation from the rest of the region. The democratic changes in Indonesia would be, would be far less robust and far less sustainable if it was an exception to the rule. Hence, we brought the language of good governance and human rights through the APSC to ASEAN. And I remember when we were trying to inject these dynamics, we were questioned by many a quarter. Uh, and, and, and surprisingly, a lot of the most uh, strongest questioning came from within Indonesia itself. Because then there was the notion as if we have so many problems at home, multidimensional crisis was the word used, that why should we even do foreign policy? Uh, let's uh, concentrate on internal, and then the, we can turn to foreign policy to ASEAN later on. There was a sense that this was uh, uh, an overreach on Indonesia's part. Uh, of course, to that uh, idea, we responded that actually foreign policy is a process. It's not something that you can switch on and off but that precisely because we needed to consolidate within, we need to have a benign external environment. But not least, we foresaw or, or we anticipate the type of uh, processes that is now quite common. The Arab Spring phenomenon, where internal uh, domestic dynamics quickly became regional conflict, became quickly proxy conflict between major powers. So we concluded then, even then, that we need to have a very thorough capacity building in this domain, which wasn't a familiar one for ASEAN, uh, no doubt. So henceforth, uh, since then, we have begun to develop the APSC as a within, uh, within the APSC, the notion of a capacity as ASEAN in governance issues, the ICHER, the ASEAN Inter Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, and the like. But again, like the intra-ASEAN uh, conflict resolution capacities, not only like, actually even more so, these are in the end only potentials. Uh, they, are, they need to be kick-start, they, be, uh, they need to be nurtured, they need to be invested in, they need to be prodded, uh, because otherwise the things will become dormant uh, or grind to a halt. And this is where, as I had suggested a couple of days ago, Indonesia, again through state practice, tried to create new dynamics within ASEAN. I mentioned before how at ASEAN former Foreign Minister's Retreat, Indonesia purposefully, purposefully and deliberately brought internal problems to ASEAN's attention. Uh, the conflict, the situation in Papua, situation in Aceh, in Poso, in Malukus, in Sampit. And, and, and I remember with my then Foreign Minister Hassan Wirayuda, we, we, we exchanged, is this something that we should be doing? Is this a good idea? But, you know, I mean, we, w once you start, you have to go at it. This is what leadership and dynamic changing is all about. We must not shirk uh, on, uh, from, uh, from an effort that you had begun uh, essentially, our, our purpose is to try to change the notion uh, as if internal problems cannot be shared among family members. And, and we look to Thailand, we look to the Philippines in particular as two hopefully similar like-minded like countries at the time uh, to also do their bit, which thankfully they did. Uh, Southern Thailand, Philippines issues, Southern Thailand issues began to be shared, and Myanmar as well took up the, the same outlook.
what I meant to say is that we had to be very purposefully um, changing the dynamics there, and even at the risk of being caught in overextending uh, our, our approach. In many instances, as I had said before, uh, what we had shared was met by deafening silence. No, none of the countries actually want to hear about these things. You know, they didn't ask for any report, they didn't ask for any information, and you know, we, we mentioned all these things and we were all greeted by deafening silence and awkwardness. But uh, we thought we need to do it. And I think on the whole, ASEAN managed then as a result to have a very, a bit more nuanced and, and calibrated approach to the issue. And I think the result has been on Myanmar. And here I'm, I mean by Myanmar is the original Myanmar uh, reform process. ASEAN has been able to have, to manage the democratic, democratic transition process in Myanmar in a, in a way without geopolitical repercussions. And for example, in parts of North Africa and the Middle East that is now prevalent today. Uh, and we have been able to, to remain united within ASEAN on Myanmar uh, and, and uh, manage the international community's expectations. In 2005, uh, Patam may, may also recall, uh, Myanmar sought to become chair of ASEAN. Uh, that was very difficult, how to manage? I mean, how can you stop a country that is their turn to chair ASEAN? And, and we had to manage that. And I remember having to explain, to, to not explain, but to suggest to them, this is not a matter of uh, your political system uh, that is set as a criterion, but actually, uh, would you want to chair ASEAN when you have far more important task, the seven point roadmap that they had begun? In other words, we change the dynamics, the way of looking at things. It's not like we are setting preconditions, but from their own perspective, actually, when you think about it, this is far more important, and uh, your championship of ASEAN should be the crowning uh, moment rather than uh, an open wound that, were, that will attract countries. So in the end, they decided to defer, and then, of course, the issue came back again in 2011. Uh, actually, uh, rather out of the blue for me, because I, I, we convened a retreat of ASEAN foreign ministers in Lombok in January 2011. I thought this would be a rather steady retreat, a uh, nice and pleasant atmosphere. But then, of course, Myanmar uh, actually had an understanding with Laos to switch uh, their chairmanship of ASEAN. And I must say, uh, all ASEAN countries stood true to form quickly endorsed Myanmar. And I have to actually uh, swim against the, the current. I, I couldn't, I didn't say I, we supported it. Uh, I said we need time. Because I knew that if ASEAN was to then endorse it there and, there and then, this will be the beginning of debate between ASEAN and its partners about is Myanmar appropriate and the like. So I suggested to Myanmar, let's, let's navigate this in a good way so we have a soft landing. So we have, by the time the decision is made, everything is already nice and, and, and well calibrated. So to all throughout the year, in an, again, in an unprecedented, unprecedented step, the chair of ASEAN was basically mandated to, uh, to get a sense of Myanmar's readiness to chair ASEAN. And by readiness here, it wasn't only logistical readiness, but in terms of is this going to contribute to Myanmar's uh, reform process and the like. Uh, and, and, and other dimension. So to all throughout 2011, together with Myanmar, again, there's no suggestion of uh, carrot and stick pontificating. No. It was a truly partnership. We work closely together, making sure that this prospect becomes momentum for positive development. I work, I mean, I had a very good conversation with Dao Aung San Suu Kyi again and explaining to her that in my view, that the uh, Myanmar chairmanship of ASEAN is not like the reward or the crowning uh, of the whole reform process that wasn't completed, but actually it becomes a momentum for acceleration for change. So the, uh, in the end, uh, we were able to, to, um, to manage it in such a way. But basically the point I wanted to say is that the internal and the external is an issue that needs constant uh, nurturing and hand-holding. Someone out there now in ASEAN must be doing this. Because this is where I think the 
biggest gap is. Otherwise, we will be down the same old route of caricature as if there is a state sovereignty, non-interference, ASEAN shutdown, and the issue becomes loose out there, as is now prevalent on the case of uh, Rohingya, for example. Dynamics changing in the internal domain, uh, in the link between national and, and, and regional, is a constant effort. Uh, we tried, as part from uh, our, ourselves, as I suggested, we, we brought our own issues as a state practice. We invited the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, and, many ad and some others to join us in our Aceh monitoring mission. And the Philippines were uh, uh, kind enough to invite Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei as well in their monitoring mission for the um, MNLF agreement, MILF agreement. So I think this is extremely important for us to be developing the habit of uh, demonstrating our uh, 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 sense of sharing and, and mutual concern, friendly mutual concern on developments in our region and our own respective uh, countries. And finally, before I conclude, uh, the dynamics of the region and the wider region, namely East Asia and ASEAN and East Asia. And I must say here, and listening to the, what had been said over the past uh, couple of days ago, there is always in ASEAN like tensions or not tensions, a wide spectrum of views between the minimalist and the more uh, maximalist thought, a school of thoughts. The one that says, "Look, let's ASEAN is small countries. We cannot influence things. Let's keep things steady." and those who feel that we must be a little bit more uh, proactive, shaping and molding. And I must, uh, by way of uh, declaration of, of where, I, uh, where I stand, I, s I believe in the more maximalist end of things. I, I find uh, 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 this to be a very important if we are to demonstrate our centrality. And, and all throughout, we have, as in Indonesia, uh, when ASEAN was formed in 1967, obviously brings together countries of divergent foreign policy orientations from uh, alignment with the United States, close relationship with China, with Russia, Soviet Union then, non-aligned. And we traveled far from a neutrality outlook represented by Zofan, which Indonesia wasn't that uh, particularly happy with because neutrality, or when you read the original 1979 Zofan document speaks of neutralization of Southeast Asia. So who is neutralizing us? Because it gives us the notion as if we are passive, we are being, uh, we are, we are being uh, opting out of developments. But in any case, all throughout, as many of you no doubt are far more informed than I, ASEAN developed its external uh, from policies or external relations, the plus one, plus threes, but the, the one that I wanted to highlight by way of uh, illustrating the dynamics uh, changing influence that Indonesia had been trying to make is on the East Asia Summit. Uh, many of you were there when I the East Asia Summit idea was discussed prior to the summit in Malaysia in 2005. The summit itself, but the discussion would have been in 2003, 2004 probably. Um, we went through the various permutations. Uh, the dominant view at the time was East Asia Summit basically is made up of the ASEAN plus three countries. Uh, and that was certainly the dominant view on, and because it was seen as being uh, the uh, accelerated uh, fruition of the sense of community from the ASEAN plus three process. Because the, the originally it was seen to be a bit longer process. But, but and I remember uh, there was the idea that uh, the ASEAN plus three meets every year, East Asia Summit meets every five years, but then uh, we were asking the question about the different ideas. Some people were, countries were asking the issue of agenda, etc. but we were more driven by the issue of the dynamics in terms of the geopolitical dynamics. Uh, we were certain that ASEAN, East Asia Summit that's made up only of the plus three and ASEAN uh, would ensure that ASEAN in the long term become less of a partner than the plus three uh, countries individually, uh, let alone uh, collectively. Hence, we were quite insistent in having Australia, New Zealand, uh, 
and, uh, and India on board from the very beginning, not as a guest of the East Asia Summit, as some other countries propose, because geographically, at least geographically, it places ASEAN in the center, but more importantly, geopolitically, it made ASEAN as the, as the hub of, of, the, 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 of the entire uh, efforts. Um, even then, I had in mind the idea of uh, dynamic equilibrium for our region, uh, where we can promote the idea of absence of preponderant power, not through balance of power, not through containment, but through the way the dynamics operate. And, and having China and having those Australia, New Zealand, and India for us was a way of ensuring such an equili equilibrium was achieved. 2011, uh, there was a need to refine it. And of course, Russia had been knocking on the door even at the very the first summit in Kuala Lumpur. Russia was already willing to join, but then Indonesia uh, <coughs> didn't wish to see Russia join at the time because we correlated with the United States joining to maintain that equilibrium, and that happened in 2011. But what, is, uh, what I wanted to emphasize is that not only the participation, but we were quick enough to quickly try to set the norms and principles for East Asia Summit participation. Uh, in 2011, the Bali principles on the rela uh, friendly relations among East Asia Summit countries was adopted, uh, among others speaking of a TAC-like non-use of force agreement between the East Asia Summit countries. Essentially, therefore, uh, for us, for ASEAN to uh, play a more manifest in a more concrete way its centrality uh, in our wider region to, um, to speak of having an uh, uh, ECC summit uh, be more operational, be operational and be effective as well. Uh, on this issue, I believe that the task at hand now, among others, is the need to make the ECC summit more than uh, what it is essentially now. Uh, I have spoken of the, of the hope one day to have a TAC-like uh, agreement among the East Asia Summit countries, to have a crisis management capacity within the East Asia Summit countries, uh, a sort of peace and security council within the East Asia Summit that can in a more timely way uh, 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 respond to any emerging crisis in our region. Before I conclude, uh, and so we can have a more uh, useful, hopefully, interactions, I wish to, to, to bring on board the Timor-Leste uh, application to uh, ASEAN. Uh, for me, personally, uh, this, is, this has been uh, an unfinished task that I, I, I feel a little bit... Uh, uh, hard on myself on, because um, uh, Timor-Leste applied to join ASEAN in 2011, early 2011, at the beginning of Indonesia's chairmanship. And now, of course, there is still a process to be gone through uh, in terms of uh, its uh, consideration by ASEAN. Geographically, Timor-Leste is part of Southeast Asia. That is uh, without any doubt. But more than geography, I believe, um, in terms of geopolitics, here is a positive story of two peoples, of two nations who have had difficult past and yet very quickly transformed their relationship in the way that it has. Very, one of the very few positive stories uh, in the world today, not often acknowledged. And here are two countries wishing for ASEAN to codify this development, to solidify it, to help us consolidate it. I find it difficult for our fellow ASEAN member countries to fail to recognize that point. I know that we want to be very precise, you know, want to study Timor-Leste imp impact on ASEAN economic community, Timor-Leste impact on ASEAN political security community, ASEAN social cultural community, perfectly fine. But in the final analysis, when all is said and done, I think we have to be at the right side of, uh, of the history here in terms of dynamics. And let's quickly uh, lock and, and get this process uh, done. Uh, 
because uh, it's extremely important for Southeast Asia, in my view, to benefit from Timor less uh, positive influence uh, in our region and to consolidate peace, security, and prosperity in our region. Uh, the fact that um, the CLMV countries in the past were of different economic stages of development never stood in the way of them joining ASEAN. In fact, ASEAN purposely and deliberately provided a mechanism for it. IAI, Initiative for ASEAN Integration, and all the other efforts that they made, they reach out to, to, to bridge the gap. I, I think Timor-Leste should benefit from that type of mindset as well, rather than setting uh, a, a, an impossible or constantly moving goalpost. But most of all, uh, I think we are in need to have this positive story be codified, be recognized for what it is. And, and I, I think uh, that is a very important uh, point to emphasize in terms of dynamics. As I said before, I feared uh, what possible new wisdom or knowledge I can impart on people of such knowledge before, before this room. The only thing I can share is my own personal thoughts because they are inherently mine, and that's how, with all their shortcomings, I have approached ASEAN cooperation. Uh, that Indonesia in ASEAN, we have, we have a capacity to make uh, a difference, a positive difference or a negative difference because of what we are uh, in ASEAN. So my mindset is to have a positive uh, contribution, and my mindset has been to ensure that there is no zero sum, either or. We can be nationally uh, driven, nationally focused, but at the same time, regionally sensitive and regionally, uh, and have the regional interests at the forefront as well. It is not often difficult to have a nuanced uh, approach, uh, connecting the, the almost unconnectable. You can be at the risk of being accused of being a little bit uh, not clear in your approach, not, not definite, but that is foreign policy. It's about agility, about nuances, uh, the gray areas. And I think Indonesia has in the past uh, managed to strike that synergy uh, between national, regional, and global. I haven't even mentioned the Bali Konko 3 that you have kindly mentioned, Dr. Tang. Uh, again, that was in response to voice with voices within Indonesia that had said that Indonesia must have a global role to play. Uh, ASEAN somehow, they say, is becoming too restrictive. And that is why, in response, I said, actually, you can walk and whistle at the same time. Uh, we take ASEAN with us. Uh, ASEAN itself becomes more global in its outlook. Then we have no more either or zero sum kind of uh, choices. Uh, it's about connectivity, it's about synergizing what appear to be conflicting interests. 